Hi, thank you so much for joining me in the Louis File today. Today we're continuing our Hebrew study, Lord willing. Um, these are some difficult uh, verses, difficult chapters. I, I just freely admit it on the front end here. Uh, there's lots of things to think about. You know, the book of Hebrews or the letter to the Hebrews really brings the whole Old Testament into play because the whole point of the book of Hebrews, the main point at least, is that Jesus is greater greater than everything that came before him, greater than the prophets, greater than the angels, greater than Moses, greater than the sacrificial system, the priesthood, the animal blood, all of that. So you have to really have a pretty good working knowledge of the Old Testament, which, you know, I thought I did, and sometimes I think I do. But when you get faced with some of these type of things, you go, oh, I need to go back and look at this again. So today we're going to we're going to start Hebrews chapter 7, but let me just say this. From Hebrews 5 all the way to about chapter 10 is Jesus and his priesthood, his per perfect priesthood. And this is why Melchizedek is so focused on here, because what the writer does is he takes us all the way back to this obscure person, character, uh, in Genesis, who met Abraham, and they have a very brief encounter, just a couple of verses. And he, the Hebrew letter, the author of the Hebrews, he, he creates, I mean, I don't want to say he created or she created, the author of Hebrews creates or uses this uh, incident to make a case about Jesus' priesthood being an everlasting priesthood, one that has no end. Uh, so with all that in mind, let's just uh, take a deep breath <laughs> Let's think about what we've read recently or what we've talked about recently. Chapter 5 of Hebrews tells us that priests are chosen from among men uh, for men. You know, so you have this go-between, a man that, that is chosen to be the representative of God to the people and, and, the, and the people to God. So he's an interceder, an intercessor guy. And so he compares the uh, priesthood, essentially, of Aaron in the first part of Hebrews 5, and then he brings up Christ. So the idea here is, is that in the same manner, uh, God picks Aaron to be priest, and he picked Jesus Christ, his son, to be priest. So in one sense, this is uh, completely and entirely up to God's whim. Uh, and we could try to understand why he does all this if we want to, but ultimately... He chooses. He's been chosen on behalf of men for things pertaining to God. Now, the Aaronic priesthood, those priests have to offer up a sacrifice for their own sins and for the people. But with Jesus, because he had no sin of his own, he doesn't have to offer up something for his own sins. He merely has to be here to offer up himself for man's sins. So that's chapter 5, essentially. Chapter 6... <clears throat> He, he warns us of not falling away from this. Don't, don't let go of the priesthood of Jesus Christ to turn back to the Aaronic or the Levitical Mosaic system, however you want to put that. Uh, basically, those things are uh, we're temporary. We're always meant to be temporary. But we got, we got this new thing coming through Christ, and we need to hold on to him. Uh, so then the last part of Hebrews 6 it says that God made a promise to Abraham, but in reality, he made a promise to himself. And I think in the last video, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> we went through that where Abraham was put to sleep and God showed him the smoking fire pot, you know, and they had the two animals cut in half and the blood. And the idea was is that God himself put Abraham to sleep and he gave him a promise based on his own good and trustworthy name, Whereas that if God didn't do what he said he was going to do, then, then the Godhead itself could be torn asunder just like these animals in this covenant promise that God gave to Abraham. So God is, uh, he is trustworthy, he cannot lie, and he's where our anchor is held, he's where our hope lies. The last part of Hebrews 6, read the verses 19 and 20, it says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Oh my, let's keep reading Hebrews 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, 
to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. Let me keep reading. Verse 5, And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth, from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Let's just stop there. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Okay, so God makes a covenant with Abraham and he promises him based on his own, by my name is essentially what he's doing here. I will fulfill what I promise to you. And we have this anchor for our soul. And that we see in the last part of Hebrews 6 is that Jesus himself has entered as our forerunner, having become our high priest forever, according to Melchizedek. So then we got a description of Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High. Uh, and then he relates it to Abraham. So we got, let's jump back for a second and just look at this for the sake of. Uh, seeing where this all began, Genesis 14. In Genesis 14, we read a story about how Lot, Abraham's nephew, was caught up in a war. There's a war between, there's four kings versus five kings. And it's, I just, I mean, it doesn't, I don't think it tells you how many men there are and how many people died per se. It doesn't give you all the stats, but I got to believe this is a huge battle. So during all this skirmish, Lot got, got taken captive uh, in this battle. News comes to Abraham that his nephew has, has been ca taken captive, and Abraham makes a move. So let's just pick up in Genesis 14, verse 14. It says, When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as, as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them, and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods, and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions, and also the women and the people. Then, after his return from the defeat of Chedor Leomor, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. Here we are in Melchizedek, Genesis 14, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. Well, there you go. Abram rallied his men went and got Lot back and a bunch of possessions and all his people and all the women. God really favored Abram here, I think, because he's like, they're not trained warriors the best I know. I mean, it does say 318 uh, trained men. I, I mean, maybe he did train them to fight. But uh, so in Genesis 14, 17, 18, 19, 20, right in there, we see Melchizedek arrives on the scene. He meets Abram in the king's valley, and right away he's connected with bread and wine, which, of course, that puts your antenna up, and you think, bread and wine? That sounds like communion. That sounds like Jesus. That sounds like the new covenant in his blood and his body broken. Uh, and then it follows that bread and wine with saying, now he was a priest of God most high. Now, this is a big deal. I mean, Abram was called out of his native land of Ur, away from his pagan idol-worshiping family and neighbors and neighborhood, to follow this the voice of this Yahweh, this one true God. Now, how that actually occurred in detail, I'm not so sure. But Abram somehow heard this and thought, this is who I'm following. So he was led out of this idolatry, it seems, and he went on this adventurous journey following after the commands of this God who he was just barely getting to know. But this God in Genesis 12, first few verses of Genesis 12, gives him a promise. You're my man and through you the whole world's going to be blessed. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And, and then uh, there's this 
battle that takes place and Abram receives his people and possessions back and all of a sudden Melchizedek shows up who is a priest of this same Most High God that Abram knows. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, as far as we know, Abram didn't have anybody outside of himself and his immediate family that had really known this God, this, immediate, this supreme God Most High. So this is a big deal. I'm sure Abram took a deep sigh of relief and he said, Oh my gosh, you have the same God I have. He's the God of righteousness, the God of peace, according to Hebrews 7. So they had this communion service out in the valley. <laughs> and then Melchizedek blesses Abram and he says, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So they're celebrating. And then Abram gives Melchizedek a tenth of the spoils of war. Now, it does not tell us here that immediately that this became an ordinance between this you know most high god and his people but we do see later on when the mosaic system comes into play that this becomes a, a rule this becomes a, a law uh, that the people of israel give a tenth of their uh, produce or a tenth of their income to the levites because According to the scripture, the Levites worked in the temple. That was their only job. And so they had no uh, property. They had no place to grow vegetables or grow food. So they had to live off of these sacrifices in the, in the tenth that the people gave. Uh, which is a whole different subject matter as far as the tithing issue. But we see a, 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 a tithe. The tithe means a tenth. We see Abraham give a tenth to Melchizedek here. Uh, we have no, I don't think we have any evidence after that that he did this ever again. So that's kind of an interesting thing to think about if you want to get off into the tithing argument. But right now we're going to stick to Melchizedek. So back in Hebrews 7, it says that uh, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils. Uh, and Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness, king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now I'm pretty sure this way of translating king of righteousness could also be translated, my king is righteous. So, anyway, it's not to say that one or the other is uh, wrong or, or correct. I think, it, you know, a lot of times in the Bible, things can be tr two things can be true that don't seem to be, you know, they seem to be opposing to each other. So, so I'm not going to squabble over that. But we have righteousness and peace here. We have a, pre we have a king priest, which is, you know, an interesting thought, uh, given the idea about how the Aaronic priesthood came about. And that's what I want to show you now. Look in Exodus 3. Okay, so we have, uh, we have Adam created and you know, put in the garden, and he was given dominion, which is like a king. And it, it seems as though Adam was, you know, he was the original king priest, if you will, maybe. He was meant to have dominion, and he was going to be the one that, you know, God spoke to Adam and threw Adam to the rest of humanity. Of course, we know that kind of fell apart but then even all the way up we have patriarchs we have Abraham and Isaac and Jacob right so they're kind of the father figure they're kind of the the one that has dominion and the one that is the that got the promises of God so they, there's kind of a king priest idea uh, implied there with Abraham Isaac and Jacob but then when we have but when we have Moses come along the the nation of Israel, Jacob's 12 tribe sons, right? The 12 sons of Jacob that became Israel, became slaves in Egypt 400 plus years. Uh, God inspires or tells Moses to go in and get his people out. And the original plan was that they would be a kingdom of priests. That, that's always been the deal. Kingdom of priests. King priest. That's, that's what God's plan was for the promised children of Abraham, the children of Israel. Uh, of course, we know it turned into something else for a long time, but I, I'm believing that that's the point all along. And so Moses is told by God to go in and get his people together and get them out of there. Let's look at that. Exodus 3, verse 16 tells us, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. God's telling Moses this. 
Verse 17, So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite to a land flowing with milk and honey. They, look at this, very crucial. Genesis 3, verse 18, God's telling Moses, They will pay heed to what you say. And you, with the elders of Israel, will come to the king of Egypt, and you will say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now, please, let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go, except under compulsion. So he's telling Moses, go to your people, the elders of Israel. They'll listen to you. Take them with you before the king of Egypt. Tell them the deal. Let them know we need, to, we need three days journey out of here to go worship. He's not going to listen easily. Uh, Genesis 3.20. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. Now, I know you're wondering, why are you reading all this, Lou? What has this got to do with Melchizedek? Well, hang on. It has something major to do, because what we're getting ready to see is possibly... Well, it's the reason why God allows Aaron to be the priest, and he... He gives Moses a pass. I want you to see this because in Hebrews we're comparing the Aaronic or the Levitical priesthood with the priesthood of Melchizedek. One is temporary, and I'm going to show you where I think it's, it's just merely a concession that God gives to Moses to push this agenda forward. And it's amazing to me how many times God concedes and he just works with failing humanity to get us there. And that's why I think it seems so long. We might want to say, God, why is it taking so long? And he's going, well, it's it's taking so long on your side, my boy. <laughs> if you would just do what I tell you, if you just trust me, we could speed this thing up. <laughs> that's what I think he's telling us. All right, so here we have Moses. God told Moses, get to the elders. They will listen to you. Bring them to, to the king of Egypt. He's not going to listen so easily. So the, so the plagues are going to hit, right? But look at what it says in, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. Ah, God already told them in, in chapter 318 or 316. No, wait a minute. I'm saying, wait a minute. 318. They will pay heed to what you say. God clearly tells Moses they will listen. Moses says in Genesis 4, 1, then Moses said, what if they will not believe me? So Moses is wobbling here. His faith is not on steady ground. Ex or, I'm sorry, I keep saying Genesis. I'm so sorry. It's Exodus. Exodus 4. What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? The Lord has not appeared to you. Exodus 4, 2. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. Then he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground. It became a serpent. And Moses got scared. All right, so now what we got here, he's going to give Moses two signs to back up the fact that he did speak to, to Moses. And he says, throw your staff down. It turns into a serpent. Pick it up. It turns back into a staff. If that don't, if that don't convince him, put your hand in your cloak. It'll come out leprous. Put it back in. It'll come out healed, whole. So he's, he's like, Moses, they will listen. Moses, what well, if they don't? Well, here's some signs to give them. Uh, then you take water from the Nile. He's got all these miracles that he tells Moses to perform if they don't. So now look in Exodus 4.10. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. He's still making excuses. This great and mighty Moses is making excuses. Verse 11, The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth, or who makes him mute, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth, and teach you what you are to say. But he said, Please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. Moses is doing everything he can to plead his way out of this. Exodus 4, 14, Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, and he said, Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he's coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he'll be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, you shall speak for your, for you, 
for you more I'm sorry for moreover he shall speak for you to the people and he will be as a mouth for you and you will be as God to him so Moses fumbles and mumbles and stutters and he's scared to death and I'm not picking on Moses because I, I may have done the same exact thing I, I'm not I'm not saying how many better than him or I would have done the same thing but I just want what I, I read all this to get this case this point across God calls Moses to do something and he backs off and he tries to get out of it and he's stumbling and worried and, and he's losing he's not trusting God so God says all right look Aaron I'll work with Aaron I'll work with you through Aaron to the people so here we have God conceding and what the seeds, the very beginning, the very origin here of this ironic Levitical priesthood that ends up carrying Israel all the way up till Jesus shows up. And this is partly, this is why you see in the Gospels where Jesus has all this conflict with the religious leaders of his day. They keep saying, well, we know God spoke to Moses. You're saying you're greater than this, and you're what? You you don't even do this. You don't wash your hands properly. You know you're you're forgiving sin. Who are you? You didn't go to our schools. So the religious leaders are seat, standing in the place of Moses. Is, Jesus even says that. So they're fighting Jesus on behalf of their perception of God, and they're saying, "We know Moses. We know this priesthood. We know this temple system. Who are you?" So they're standing for what they believe God is telling them and told them. And Jesus is standing there as the new priest in the line of Melchizedek, an everlasting eternal priesthood. He's like, I have come to open up your understanding. We need to put away the temporary and embrace the eternal. And he uses all the I am statements in John to make the case. But what I want you to see is that Aaron's priesthood is a concession. God is allowing this because of Moses' apparent unbelief. God's always wanted to be one man, to be the king and the priest. But since Moses fell back, he kind of wobbled away from it, he brings in Aaron. So now we have this split thing. Uh, so Aaron's priesthood was plan B. Melchizedek is a type of Christ. Uh, he is a shadow. He is a foretelling. He, I think they, I think one person I heard called it a uh, a non. He's a non-verbal prophecy. I mean, his life, who he was, who he is, is pointing us to Jesus Christ. So now let's look back in Hebrews seven. I'm trying to decide if I want, how far I want to go on this video before I just, I may have given you more than you need today. I don't know. Uh, let's look back in Hebrews 7. So Abraham gives a tenth of the spoils to this guy, who's the king of righteousness, the king of Salem, which is what turns into Jerusalem, the city of David. That's a good thing we can point out. At the other place that uh, Melchizedek is mentioned you have Genesis 14, but then you have Psalm 110. I'm not going to read all that, but in Psalm 110 is where we get, we kind of connect David into the pile here. So we have Abraham, the man of faith, connected to Melchizedek, the priesthood, king priest forever. And now we have David. So we have kingdom, we have dominion, we have priesthood. We got all this stuff piled up together. And I find it fascinating. All right, so when you look in Romans 4 or Galatians 4, I think it's Galatians 4, what's, Galatians 3 maybe, what you see in the Apostle Paul's writings when he comes to the issue of faith or righteousness, he says, well, what can we learn about these things through Abraham, the father of our faith? So he, what he does is he leaps all the way over Moses and the animal sacrifices and the temple and the law. He jumps all the way over it back to Abraham, and he says, look at that. God gave Abraham a promise. Abraham believed God and it was counted as righteousness. So Abraham is kind of, he's kind of the, the, what, the plumb line, if you will. Abraham believed God he, and God says, you're righteous. And now here he is with this man Melchizedek and, and he's got king of righteousness, king of peace. He's got bread and wine. He's got victory over all these enemies. He's got the rescue of his family, the saving, the salvation of Lot and his family. It's quite an amazing picture. 
So when you see Jesus now in Hebrews, we have him, he's the son of David, uh, and it, which takes us all the way back to Abraham, right? So everything's tied up real nice and neat here. Look at uh, Hebrews 7, verse 3. It says, without father, without mother, without genealogy. Melchizedek has no father, mother, or genealogy, neither beginning of days nor end of life. But it says, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. All right, this is where a lot of people say, well, he was a divine being. He was God in the flesh. He was a pre-Christ uh, you know, appearance. Well, I get all that. I understand all that. But I think the, the point he's making is you keep reading Hebrews 7. He, he brings up Levi. So he brings up the Levitical priesthood, and he, and he compares it to this Melchizedekian priesthood. You got the Aaronic or Levi, Levitical priesthood is temporary, but it also was handed down through the one tribe, the tribe of Levi. This is how it's set up, right? If you're not in the tribe of Levi, you're not going to be a priest in the earthly temple. It's not going to be. It's not going to happen because it's the main requirement, one of the main requirements. So what he's doing is he's showing that Melchizedek, I don't think he's trying to say he didn't have a mother or father or he didn't have a family lineage, but the point is it's not brought up because God appointed him king priest. God said, that's what you are. That's who you are. Just like he did with Jesus, he called the shots on this, and you're a priest perpetually. And it's not based on your father handing it down. It's not based on your tribal affiliation. It's not, a, it's not based on your family lineage, your genealogy. Melchizedek shows up, and we don't have any of that to go by. So now with Jesus, right, they, they used to shout at him. They said, well, you know who your father is. You're, you know, basically... He was not qualified to, to operate as a priest in the temple, which is a mind blower to me. Jesus, the perfect sinless son of God, would not have qualified to, to serve his term, if you will, in the earthly temple. Because it was temporary. It was a concession that God gave to Moses with Aaron. Fascinating to me, mind blowing. And I maybe have said that, said that one too many times. <laughs> but I hope this is hitting you the way it's hit me. So when it says in Hebrews 7, 3 that Melchizedek's without father, without mother, without genealogy, it's not meaning that he, would, he just appeared out of nothing. It means that he's a priest forever without regard to tribe or genealogy, just like Jesus Christ is. He was a priest because God said so. He didn't, he wouldn't have, he didn't have a genealogy or tribal connection to be an earthly priest, but yet here he is one perpetually. which What this is telling us is that when we see Melchizedek in Genesis 14, and then we see Aaron brought in in Exodus 4, the Aaronic Levitical priesthood is a temporary insert, but the Melchizedekian eternal everlasting perpetual priesthood was still going. I think, but it was not noticeable on the surface. And I think what's happened is, is this surfacey animal blood contextual material tent or temple and tabernacle, all that took precedent. So that now when Jesus is born, this, this seed of Abraham rises up and grows up amongst them. He is now, the, he's, the focus is shifted to him. And he's, he's sort of like, look, look at that. There's a precedent. Melchizedek is like unto the Son of God. He isn't divine. He doesn't have to be divine to be like unto the Son of God. Paul uses Adam in the Romans letter. He says, we have a first Adam and a last Adam, meaning Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, he does it again. So we have a human Adam that is a picture and a representation of Jesus Christ, the God who is everlasting, who became a man, took on flesh, dwelt among us, <laughs> who went to the cross, died, was buried, rose again, went up into heaven and entered behind the veil in the heavenly tabernacle. Not an earthly one, not with animal blood, but with his own blood. He offered up his own blood. This is where we're going in this Hebrew letter, and I am so excited, if you can't tell. I hope that you will stick with me as we move along. But today, I think I've said more than enough. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, your attention. And I pray that you would share this with anyone that you feel uh, led to share it with. There's no, nothing it costs you but a few moments of your day. I'll see you on the next Louis file.